Okay. So, uh, thank you, Dede. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank uh, Stefano for the invitation to talk uh, at this conference. I also want to have the opportunity to say how happy I am to be here. I mean, I think this is one of the most fantastic institutions we have in Italy. I mean, it's not an Italian institution. It's very much supported by the Italian government. But I think, really, this is a, an extraordinary story. The ICTP is very nice. It does a fantastic job. I myself do a lot, owe a lot of my knowledge and my career, and my networking to having been a student like some of the younger people are here 27 years ago. So I'm really happy to say thank you, ICTP, and keep on doing this fantastic job. Now, after this uh, uh, short introduction and celebration well deserved of ICTP, uh, mm, let me tell you a little bit what I want to do. So actually what I want to do is to provide a little bit, uh, the, the title is frightening and not is very inspirating, so I'm grateful to all of you who despite the sun are here. Uh, what I will try to do is to put this a little bit in perspective, so tell you why uh, after, I mean, since 10, 15 years, there is a certain number of people who are trying to do uh, certain generalizations of results which have been painfully obtained uh, in the case of um, circle maps, uh, to a generalization of circle maps, which are interval exchange maps. Okay, so let me start with a short introduction, just, just a little bit. Okay, so uh, I will fix a little bit of notation on the oftentimes numbers and uh, um, continued fractions because I will not need them a lot, but I, I will need them a little bit in the, in the future. So if, if, if alpha is an irrational number, we all know that we can associate to alpha its infinite continued fraction. This is actually unique, and it's this writing uh, of where all the or a naught is a relative integer, and all the other AIs are actually uh, integers which are, no, which are actually positive. And uh, uh, so th this is actually, there is actually a, a unique way to do, to, to write this. And uh, we, we denote normally, uh, these, these AIs are called the uh, partial quotients. And then if you truncate at order n, you obtain what are called the convergence. And there is a, a and a characterization of the Ophantine number, so let me just recall you that if tau is non negative, the set of the Ophantine numbers with exponent tau is actually the set of irrational numbers such that there exists a positive constant gamma for which one has uh, alpha minus p over q greater or equal than gamma over q2 plus tau for all rationals p over q. I will try. Uh, and this is uh, the same as the uh, set of irrational numbers. So you can just use the growth of the denominators of the convergence, which always grow unconditionally exponentially fast, as a, as a characterization, saying that it has to, it's the same as qn plus 1 big O of qn to tau. Okay, as soon as tau is positive, then this has a full measure. It's a full measure set oh, in the real line. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Basam. One plus tau, absolutely. Excellent. Equivalently, you can write a n plus one big O of q n to the now with now. Okay, thank you very much. And, uh, and, uh, and there is a class which is, to some extent, if, if tau is zero, then, then the set is, is called constant type, and uh, it has not full measure. And there is a class which is sort of intermediate, which is Roth type. Which is just the intersection for all positive tau of this theta. Okay? So basically, uh, a number is of Roth type if for all positive tau there is a 
positive constant gamma, such that this is true for all P over Q. Uh, so uh, Roth type is called this way because there is a celebrated theorem by Roth in 1955, which is the end of a long story. Uh, well, it's, it's still too small. proved that irrational, irrational algebraic numbers are, uh, belong to our theory. Uh, OK, so you may wonder what does this have to do with dynamics, but it does have, it does, it has to do with dynamics uh, for the following reason. Let's consider now circle maps. So just let's start from the simplest case, which is the rotation on the circle. Which is also, just to start to talk about interval exchange maps, the simplest example of an interval exchange map if you forget about periodicity. Because if you look at the graph of, of a rotation of, uh, of an angle alpha, so fundamentally, if this is the diagonal, what you get is that if you forget about periodicity, it splits into parts. This is 1 minus alpha. And if you call A and B these two intervals, you can see the action of the mass as permuting these two intervals, which is basically the only way you have to exchange intervals uh, if you have only two. Okay? So. So this is just, just to remind that the simplest case of interval exchange map is a rotation. Now, uh, um, if you have the, the rotations, you, you can ask, you can actually characterize the set of Roth numbers as well also as the set of Diophantine numbers. I will just call DC the union instead of the intersection of DC tau. So there are two uh, easy theorems that you can prove. I mean, the, 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 the first uh, theorem, this is really easy if you want an exercise, is that uh, uh, for all an um, alpha being the Ophantine is equivalent to the fact that uh, for all function uh, uh, phi of C infinity, over the circle, and of zero mean, there exists a unique function psi, which is also C infinity on the circle, and of zero mean, such that uh, psi composed with our alpha minus psi is equal to phi. OK? Uh, this is easy. What is not so easy at all, it's a theorem, actually, which I will call theorem one, uh, which is due to, fundamentally, I think, Hermann, Rusman, and I think also Yokoth, but he denies it. But I think it's also Yokoth, yes, right? Uh, which says that uh, you can equivalently characterize Roth numbers in a similar way. Namely, uh, alpha is a Roth number, is of Roth type. The statement is a little bit less sexy, I mean, but it's still reasonably uh, elementary. For all uh, RS real numbers such that R is greater or equal, sorry, is greater than S plus 1, greater or equal than 1. And for all function phi, which is of class uh, CR over the circle, and of zero mean, there exists a unique psi in CS 
which solves the cohomology. This will be called, this is the cohomological, cohomological equation. I will make, we'll say more about this in a second. Such that, which is also and of zero mean, uh, such that this is true, okay? Cohomological equation. Okay. Uh, just to tell you in a nutshell what is the idea behind the proof of both theorems, the idea on the circle is very elementary, then uh, it's also elementary to get there. It's not so elementary, it requires more sophistication to get there, but it's not terribly complicated. Uh, the idea is just that you use Fourier analysis on the circle, I mean, uh, very easily, and you rewrite this equation at the level of the Fourier coefficients, and you see that what happens is that psi at of n times e to the 2 pi i n alpha minus 1 has to be equal to phi hat of n for all n integer non-zero. And now, uh, well, now this behaves fundamentally how? Well, if you know that alpha is the Ophantine of exponent tau, then this essentially, this will lead you to the estimate that psi hat of n will be bounded by some constant times phi hat of n times absolute value of n to 1 plus tau. Okay. And then if you, at least one implication of the, the implication, this arrow here is going to be clear to you because being C infinity means that the Fourier coefficients decay faster than any um, power. So, I mean, the one arrow is is clear. If you want to get the other arrow, you have to build counterexamples, but that is not very complicated. On the other hand, if you want to work, as you do here with Holder uh, differentiability, then you have to do a non-substantial, a substantial work using uh, uh, um, Paley-Littlewood theory and Aldamar interpolation to, 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 to prove this statement. So this is really a, a theorem, a bona fide theorem. It's not a, a, just an exercise, but you can do it. What is also clear is that if you are interested just to the Sobolev kind of estimates, then this is all what you need, okay? Because Sobolev spaces for periodic functions are really usually characterized by looking at Fourier coefficients and the way they behave. So in Sobolev scale, this is transparent. Okay, so one of the goals I will have, and the main motivation for the title of my talk, is to provide not at all, unfortunately, an equivalent statement for all general, in, for, for all interval exchange maps, but to provide a partial result in this direction, okay? A result which goes in the direction of getting here. It's weaker. It contains a weaker statement of this in the circle, but it is in the same spirit. Now, why is this stuff interesting? At least, why, what, what's the motivation behind looking at the cohomological equation in case you need one, which is, after all, legitimate, okay? I do like it, so I don't need it very much but I'm probably an odd guy. Most regular guys will say, why the hell are you doing this? Okay, the reason for which you're interested to the cohomological equation is rather uh, clean, and it has to do with the following thing. It has to do with the fact that, after all, if you think of the circle, the role of the uh, rotation is so sound, is so uh, important, that you may ask yourself the question of what is, what dynamical systems are actually, are indeed conjugate to rotations. So uh, what you really would like to understand is uh, are the conjugacy classes of the rotation. And this is actually in the case of the circle, one of the very rare uh, cases where we do have a lot of information. We have a full characterization in the C-infinity and in the analytic case, and there is also a lot of information in the Holder case, which is very rare. Uh, you could be less ambitious to begin with, and instead of asking for the full conjugacy class of the rotation, you could ask at least what happens locally. So you may say, okay, let me now try to move from the rotation to something more general. Let me take F, which is a, 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 an orientation preserving D field of class CR of T, and let me assume it that CR close to our alpha, and, uh, and let me ask, I mean, let me, if you want, denote with CRS lock. So lock refers to this characterization. The set of the F like this, such that there exists H, which is a, 
and CS, uh, um, a diffeo of, 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 the, of the circle such that conjugates F to an alpha. Okay? If you drop the assumption of being CR close to the rotation, then you just will have CRS. Okay? And then fundamentally, there is a second theorem. which has many names, at least uh, to my knowledge. I apologize, some of the names are in the room if the attribution is uh, fuzzy. But fundamentally, it's a theorem which owes to Hermann, Katznelson, Ornstein, Kanin, Sinai, Jokot. And maybe someone is missing, but I apologize which says the following, uh, try to say it cleanly. That for all positive epsilon, dc, r minus s minus one minus epsilon, is containing crs, is containing crs log. Is it large enough? Can you read something? I see people nodding at least in the first four lines of fire. I, I owe you a beer. OK, thank you. I keep going. <laughs> Someone is also nodding in the top. DC R minus S minus 1 plus epsilon. OK? So uh, basically it tells you, uh, so this is actually what, what, what is the global uh, conjugacy Theorem. This is the local class, of course. But it, I mean, it's 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 major achievement that also in the Holder class you can characterize not exactly these sets. For example, we don't know if these two are different or the same. We don't have equalities. Okay, we don't know exactly what are these classes, but at least we have a good amount of information. So uh, what I will also try to tell you is the statement of the theorem. It's a space, uh, thank you, it's a space of alpha such that for all f, it's a, it's a space of, of, of rotation numbers. You want to characterize the rotation numbers. Thank you, thank you. For all f, uh, like here, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, in particular, just to give you a, a little flavor of how Roth type gets into the thing, uh, what happens is that uh, 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 Roth type is included in C log. Sorry, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. And the rotation number of F is alpha. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Otherwise. <laughs> Strange thing. Uh, R, R minus 1 minus epsilon for all epsilon positive. Okay, so this is basically, if you want a special case of 2, and the goal of the next uh, uh, 25 minutes will be to provide you also, I mean, the statement of an analog of theorem 1 and the statement of analog of theorem 2, uh, neither, no, neither the analog of theorem 1 or theorem 2 are fully satisfactory, but at least go beyond the circle case. Okay? Uh, let me just remind you that the two questions I mentioned, namely, are these sets, are these two classes the same? And to, act, and to say exactly what they are, at least in the local case or in the global. But, I mean, just to characterize exactly the set of rotation numbers which, for which you have this it are open and are explicitly stated in the proceedings of the of a school on small divisors we held in Chetrari in 1998. So I just want to draw the attention of young people that in quasi-periodic dynamics, even in the circle case, there is still a number of questions open. Okay? It's not a closed field. It's not over I mean, at all. There's no 
to be to be completely honest, I don't know. But I mean, I think that the, we don't, in general, know if they are different or not. I mean, the, 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 the full understanding of the thing is not there. I don't master all the literature, to be honest. So I'm not 100% sure that uh, I may miss something which has been happening. But I don't think I think I have good faith in the fact that the, saying that the problem is still open is is a, is a fair statement. It seems, but it seems. In infinity, sure. OK, in infinity, but in, and, uh, in they don't. no, they don't. Because there are two different conditions. I mean, Bruno and condition H. OK. OK. Now, uh, very quickly, let me get to interval exchange maps now. So we move from uh, circle maps to interval exchange maps. So I mentioned it that when you have a, a circle map, you do have an interval exchange map. It, it's a map which exchanges two intervals, as I tried to convince you with the drawing I'm leaving on the blackboard. But now let me give you a proper definition. So T is, a, which, so you have an interval, so you have a map of an interval into itself. And you will say that it is an interval exchange map. If the following is true, well, it's simply one to one. And locally, a translation. Except at finitely many uh, discontinuities. I also want to define, taking advantage of colors, a generalized generalized interval exchange map as a map of an interval which is one to one and locally I replace a translation with a uh, orientation preferred orientation preserving homeo. Okay? So basically for example, in this case, it would be instead of doing this, you do something like, like that, OK? OK. So uh, to each interval exchange map, you can associate a few numbers and basically two data which completely characterize the parameters. You have a 10. You need to, to specify them. So the, uh, the, the two numbers are first of all d, which is just the number of intervals. Okay, so this is the case d equal to two, uh, but you may have uh, exchanging three or four or more intervals, of course. And uh, then uh, there are other numbers you want to associate, which are called the genus g and the number of market points s, which are somehow. Uh, as the name suggests, related to the fact that interval exchange maps have the same relationship to the flow and translation surfaces which have been described by Anton Zorich in his talk last week and which certainly will reappear, I think, this week uh, in other talks by Corinna or Sasha, I don't know. Uh, but I really would like to uh, be minimal on that because I am already short in time. But anyhow, the idea is that uh, uh, the first thing to say is that to every interval exchange map, you associate some combinatorial data because in the case of two intervals, there is not much combinatorics to say. You have two intervals and the only way you have to exchange them is to permute them. But of course, when you have three or more intervals, you have several ways of permuting them, okay? So uh, in base, in fundamentally what you do is that you label the intervals with some alphabet, A, whose cardinality is going to be D. And then you provide yourself two bijections, pi, I will denote them either T or B for top and bottom, which tells you how the intervals labeled by the letters in A, which typically are A, B, C, D, E, F, say that D is equal to six, are put one after the other before and after the application of the map, okay? 
So for example, in this case, you would have A, B, and B, A, and the two maps would be the first one sending A into one and B into two, and in this case, sending B into one and A into two, because you are exchanging the order, okay? Anyhow, we have two bijections from A to one D, which tell you what are the order of the intervals before and after you apply the map. And then the other data you need, apart from the combinatorics, are the length data. So actually, uh, you have an interval which will be split for example in this way and you will have basically lambda alpha which is going to be this is actually normally denoted the interval i t a i t b and i t c T and refers to top line and bottom line, and what happens is that the map sends the points in this way, of course. So lambda alpha is the length of I alpha T, which is going to be the length of I alpha bottom for a standard, uh, because you are just uh, doing it by translation. So the length data, which is a vector of no positive real numbers, of D positive real numbers, and the two permutations completely characterize the parameter space. Now, uh, as I mentioned, so D is the number of intervals, S is the number of market points in the invariant in the translation surface you can build by suspending the interval exchange map in a similar way that you can build a translation surface on a torus for uh, starting from a rotation. And Z, G is the genus, and there is a relationship between these three numbers, G actually only depends, and also S, on the, on, the, on the permutation, and the relation being that G is equal to D minus S plus 1 over 2. So, for example, this is still an example. This ABC going into CBA is still an example in genus 1 with two market points. D is equal to 3. Okay? If you want, or however, you can build examples in any finite genus, if you make A, B, C, D going into D, C, B, A, uh, you get D equal to 4, genus equal to 2, and S equal to 1. Um, if you make A, B, C, D, E, F into, uh, let me make it less standard than usual, A, D, A, F, C, B, you now have D equal to 6, S equal to 3, and therefore the genus is still equal to 2. Okay, but you can play with, around with this in many, many ways. Okay, let me now give you, I would like not to erase them if I manage, the statements with generalized theorem 1 and theorem 2. In Latin, you would say simania parvis compone relicet with a little bit of overstatement because they are not as precise as theorem 1 and theorem 2. Okay? I mean, but... but you try to go beyond the circle and torus case to the general case of interval exchange maps and of arbitrary surfaces, okay? So I start actually from the statement which tries to generalize theorem two with this statement. Okay. Call it theorem two prime, and this is actually due to Pierre Moussa, Jean Christophe Jocotz, and myself. And it appeared in 2012. So it's a, if you want, it's a local linearization theorem. for generalized interval exchange maps. OK, so you start with a standard interval exchange map T0, which we call of restricted Roth type. And I will 
hopefully say something about what does it mean. It includes, in d equal to 2, the case of Roth type. So it boils down to Roth type when you are on the circle. But you have to make several other assumptions when you want to deal with general interval exchange maps. Fundamentally, what happens is that you have to build some sort of generalized uh, continued fraction, which you will use to understand the, the, the orbits, okay? Because the strategy of the proof will be fundamentally to try to solve, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, to prove uh, using a, a certain trick, uh, the cohomological equation. The, the trick is, is due to Hermann, it's called the Schwartz and derivative trick. But there is a way somehow to reduce to a sort of fixed point theorem the, this thing using the cohomological equation, and you need to build a solution. To build a solution, you have to understand how certain orbits uh, give rise to Birkhoff sums which stay bounded. And eventually, this is done by using matrices which generalize the matrices you have from the continued fraction, which are not two by two positive matrices anymore, but they are larger. And since they are larger, they have a more complicated spectrum on which you need to put some assumptions. Otherwise, you will not get out of it. Because if you have just an SL to that matrix, fundamentally, it will start growing, or you will have one positive, it will be hyperbolic naturally, and you will be happy. But in this case, you have to be more careful. And this is what this restricted Roth type copes with. I mean, it includes the standard case of the circle, but it's a little bit more sophisticated. Okay, now take R to be an integer at least equal to 2, and let T be a CR plus 3, Simple deformation of T naught. Okay, what does this simple deformation mean? Well, basically it means what you see on the blackboard in the two cases. It means that T, which is the red thing, coincides with T naught near the discontinuity points. Actually, a little bit better than this. You really want them to coincide in a neighborhood of the discontinuity points, okay? This is not really needed, but I just want to give the statement in this case. So think of T essentially, if you want, as a simple deformation refers to this. This assumption of simplicity could be avoided. You can get there with some derivative, but then you have an invariant which has to be preserved. I don't want to talk about that. Let me just mention this. It's a sort of bona fide simple perturbation of the linear case, okay? Just, just with no strings attached. So this, the theorem says essentially that the set of uh, the simple deformations Uh, which are CR conjugate. So unfortunately, you use three derivatives to T naught is a C1 submanifold uh, 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 oh, yes, to T naught by a C R close to identity conjugation is a C R uh, is a C one submanifold of codimension, and the codimension is not too bad, but certainly uh, bigger than what you, what you have in the circle case. Is G minus one times two R plus one plus S. Just notice, just notice that this codimension is fine if G is equal to 1, because this vanishes, okay? And you are just left with S, so in the circle S would be 1, and you would be happy, okay? Because the codimension in the circle case is simply that you need to fix the rotation number and to have the perturbation of zero mean, okay? So this is exactly what you're seeing. The map is close to, yes, this is a, yes, absolutely. This is also, otherwise you will never be able to conjugate by something which is CR close. Okay? Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm describing, uh, if you want, what a, this C1 is a manifold is a set of T, which are CR plus three simple deformations, and so on and so on and so on. 
so the set of the TCR simple deformations, which are CR conjugate. Okay? Is it clear? Okay. Now, uh, one motivation for what we have been doing and for the statement uh, of what generalizes uh, uh, theorem one, so what I will call theorem uh, one, two. Uh, what I Yes. Yes. Well, or you have higher codimension if you are dealing with interval exchange maps with more than two intervals, and you have more market points. Okay. Because typically the the, the idea the, the idea is that essentially that somehow the market points generate also codimensions. They also generate what are called form invariant distributions, which become more explicit in what we do. I'm I'm putting, uh, for the moment, I hope I will be able to make a comment in the last two minutes, a huge amount of work without which this would be inconceivable. Okay? This doesn't come out of the blue. This is possible because there has been amazing progress in understanding the dynamics of, of the Teichmüller flow and of uh, translation surfaces and renormalization due to the work of many people, starting from the pioneering work of Mazur and Vich, and then Konsevich, Zorich, Giovanni Forni actually has been doing the main contributions in making small divisor theory enter the theory of translation surfaces, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm, I'm neglecting a lot of work for the time being because I was trying to give a guide lecture of the two statements I wanted to give you. Okay? But I will comment on this later, hopefully. Okay, uh, there is clearly an open problem which motivates a little bit uh, uh, the, what I'm about to state, which is the a weaker generalization of that one. So, uh, so why is this the analog of this? Well, because this Roth type generalizes to this condition, which is here. Uh, the setting is of interval exchange maps and of generalized interval exchange maps, which generalizes respectively rotations and uh, defills of the, of, uh, of the circle close to rotations, which are uh, inside this. And what, I'm, what we are stating is basically a theorem which is similar to this one, except that we have CR, CR minus three, okay? Which is definitely much worse than what is here, and which leads us exactly to the open problem, which would be to match this statement, namely, uh, can one prove it? Problem, question. Is it true for uh, CR plus one plus epsilon simple deformations? Okay, because this would make really the, the parallel of this, okay? Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know, but uh, at the level of the cohomological equation, we are somehow getting a little bit closer to this. Not quite, but a little bit. Uh, in the sense that we are getting a little bit closer, but not exactly, to one of the two arrows here. Okay? Here there are two arrows. This is very beautiful, at least to certain eyes. <laughs> I find it, and a few others in the world find it very beautiful, because you have a purely arithmetical thing which is characterized in terms of a solution of a dynamical equation. Okay? So in general, uh, it, it tells you that if you look at problems in a certain way, Dynamical systems or certain equations which are natural in dynamical system theory provide you uh, equivalences to, con to things which are natural in number theory, which is sort of bridge, right? Which we maybe don't understand till the end, but it's always very nice to have it. So uh, um, what, what, we now, what I will now state is a, a weak generalization of the theorem to interval exchange maps where we basically get a generalization, certainly not of the if and all if, but of one of the two arrows. 
Unfortunately, not quite as beautiful as this one. So let me give you the second statement. Uh, well, I think I have to erase this, so I will do it. Okay, so this theorem is actually the one which gives the title to today's talk, and it's a theorem that Jean Christophe and I proved last year. Okay, and it's the following precise statement of the cohomological equation. So uh, let T naught be a, an interval exchange map of as I mentioned before, restricted rough type. Okay. And then for all R greater than greater than one, there exists a positive delta and the subspace. F of CR of, uh, okay, let me write it in this way and tell you immediately what it is. Okay, we have T naught, and we denote with UI the breakpoints of the intervals, okay? So we have the, 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 the interval I, and then we have U naught, and U1 and UD, which are the endpoints, then you have U1, U2, up to UD minus 1, okay? Which are just the. And then what I'm saying here is that I'm taking just the, the product of functions which are CR on each of these closed intervals, okay? So, and I call it in this way, okay? Uh, the co dimension of F. is going to be G plus S, genus plus number of market points. And then there is a linear operator, and there exists a linear operator, L, L which goes from F to Hölder continuous functions over the whole interval. Okay? Such that if psi is the image of L of phi under this, then phi is equal to psi run t minus psi. So you can solve the cohomological equation, okay? For all phi in you know. L. Yes? Yeah, this is what I tried to say, but I said it very quickly and probably it was not even clear to myself. So I, I have the interval i, and I have the the, I split it into D intervals according to the top. There are two partitions, right? Before and after application of the map. Let's focus for a second to the one before the application of the map. And I call the U0, I have D points. U0 and UD are the endpoints of the interval, which is fixed. And from U1 to UD minus 1, you have the other endpoints. And with this, I denote the space, the product of functions. It's actually the Cartesian product of the functions which are CR, on each of these closed intervals. Okay. Are a function defined ever there, but they are also, the restriction to each of the closed intervals is CR. Uh, they don't need to match, okay, but they're, okay. On the other hand, what you get here is holder continuity everywhere. This is what you need, okay? So the holder continuity here is on the interval itself. So the, the, it's to give a proper statement, okay, but fundamentally it is telling the same thing of this RO with several caveats. The caveat is that for all R, there exists a delta, whereas here, here you have simply a relation, okay? So you, what you're saying here is that basically all what you need is S to be smaller than R minus one. That's not quite what we get, okay? 
because this delta will depend on R. It's not independent. So fundamentally, it's true that if R is just a little bit above 1, then we get a little bit of older continuity. So we are close in spirit to that one. But I can't say that this stays true if R is big. It may happen that R is 20 and delta is still 6. So the gap could grow with differentiability. Okay? And it's only one error. We don't get the other error. Uh, well, there was a, just to show you, I, I'm honest, there was a, a fifth page, which was relation to Forney and open problems. But my time is over. I apologize, and thanks a lot. <laughs>